Welcome to The Notorious Scoundrels, a Star Wars Legion podcast bringing you the latest news, general perspective, and competitive discussion. Hello and welcome back to The Notorious Scoundrels podcast. I'm Kyle. I'm here with Tim and Austin. What's up, gentlemen? What's up, Kyle? Good to, good to be on the, the inaugural uh, Scoundrels appearance. It's, uh, it's exciting. Who is this guy? Uh, just just a florida florida guy florida florida man yeah i've got alligators and uh you know i like going to bucky's what can i say <laughs> you get those little uh uh the bag of they're like uh, chips is the wrong word uh oh the puffs or... yeah yeah the little puffs yeah yeah <laughs> it's a funny story about that i got home from lone star and fresh fresh in the bag unopened it's the first thing in the suitcase when my wife goes to like un- like open it and unpack and everything she's like what are these like she loves buckies uh-huh. and i'm they're for you <laughs> totally, <laughs> like totally improv like uh-huh. them, but you know what i could get some wife points here <laughs> there you go yeah, yeah. i got sure. these specifically for you i was thinking of you when i got them <laughs> exactly yep no, she loved them though. The, there were the uh, beaver nuggets. Beaver nuggets. That's it. I couldn't think of the name. Yeah, those yeah. are very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for those that don't know, Austin uh, is one of our writers on our staff. So it puts out blog articles. Also on one of our other podcasts, the Fifth Trooper podcast, okay. uh, with Evan. And do you guys have a third, or do you have like a rotating? Yeah, great. It's. It's been pretty consistently me, Evan, and uh, and Grammar. Okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nick. Uh, I've been having fun there. Yep, yeah, awesome. Um, so and and of course Austin also just won Lone Star Open. Uh, th- that's not why you're on, but you know it's worth mentioning anyway because this is going to be our competitive week podcast. Um, and is that's it? That's your third frontline tournament this year, right? That you've won. Yeah, I had, like a, okay. had Cherokee, uh, and then um, ACO, and then Lone Star, and then Rocky Top is not FLG, but but yeah, this uh, I wasn't with Fifth Trooper when I went to Cherokee, but everything since then. It's, so, it's a, so it's actually four like convention style tournaments. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I forgot Wild. about Rocky Top. Yeah. Um, yeah, a uh, both Blizzard player and then more recently uh, Droids with Cat Bane, uh, and also before Blizzard you played Droids too, right? Yeah, Droids were primarily like I would I would play like I played Shadow Collective at Gen Con last okay. year, played some Rebels here and there. Um, the only faction I've never actually brought to a tournament, I've been meaning to, it just kind of doesn't like work out. Uh, what is Gar? Like I've I've been meaning to play Republic at some tournament, but I just haven't really like gotten around to it. Well, you might have to remedy that. They're pretty good now. I know, I know. I've been been really thinking about it. Any any clones is pretty uh pretty reliable. All right. Well, uh, let's do a little housekeeping first, then we'll hit our main topic. Housekeeping. So if you like this podcast or any other podcast on our network or our blog or any of the other content that we produce, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash the fifth trooper. That money goes towards maintaining this podcast. It goes towards paying our content creators. Uh, it goes towards equipment. Um, maybe get Austin uh, a real webcam. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you... <clears throat> If you like our content, uh, please support us on Patreon. You'll also get access to our Discord server for as little as a dollar, I think. Um, so there are various levels, but you can do as little as a dollar for Patreon. So uh, you can also check out our website for lots of various products. We have uh, lots of gaming aids, tokens, stuff like that. But um, also we have actual Star Wars Legion product. So if you need some Star Wars Legion stuff, you can go to our website, thefifthtrooper.com. And look for that. Use promo code SWLegion for 10% off. Um, all right. Short but sweet. All right. Should we hit our main topic? 
I'm, let's I'm do it dive right in all right let's go exploring the notorious scoundrels so people have been asking about like how do you play different archetypes basically and what we mean by archetypes are essentially like different types of lists there is um i think we're going to be doing legion uh variety a little bit of a disservice here by trying to classify everything um because there's actually quite a lot of diversity and one discussion that we had actually before this cast is is i'm like austin what would you call your triple magna guard cad bane list and he's like no uh so we're not gonna we're not gonna capture every possible different type of list here um these these are kind of like just kind of the main themes of lists and of course uh your own list or someone else's list may vary and skew this is more like kind of like a seven-sided shape what's that seven-sided shape called septagon is that a thing uh seven you're yeah the, you're the engineer tim well i'm not no well this is all this is not <laughs> what we do <laughs> um i can draw a seven-sided shape for you on cad okay yeah that's true uh just not know what it's called okay anyway exactly this, yeah. it's kind of like so there's the reason i say seven is there's seven archetypes that we've come up with um i guess i should why that number is relevant and it's like um, six and a half <laughs> it's really six and a half yeah because one of them is very specific so how about we call it six uh and you can you know a list can kind of be like anywhere inside that shape whether it's like towards one or towards the other and somewhere in between um but for purposes of discussion today we're going to break them down into those archetypes so um we'll talk about each of them in turn but they are basically gun line force user gun line speeders force user with speeders uh an armor skew a melee skew and then in its own category all by itself bright tree village which uh tim was contending <laughs> before the cast is distinctly different from a melee skew which i tend to agree because it plays a little bit different than a normal melee skew but we'll get there do uh I just had a last second thought. Yeah. Would we classify Hero Hammer as a art as an archetype? Like, you know, all the rebel friends, like uh I, I know Izzy, like Izzy plays Iden double bound. Like I uh, Izzy actually plays a lot of like Hero Hammer. Like, is that its own archetype, do we think? Uh that's fair. I guess why don't we call that like a playmaker list? Can we call that a playmaker Ooh. list? Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Like that? yeah. And that and that also might be what Austin's list is. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Because you got Cad uh, Bane in there. Yeah. 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 Just anything that like relies heavily on a hero, I guess. The yeah. but one that is not a force user. Yeah. yeah. Would probably a bounty hunter, but um yeah. we'll call it. We'll call it a playmaker list to be to be equitable because not all the bounty hunters actually have bounty like Boba Fett for rebels. So, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, so that's eight. Well, there you go. It's an octagon. Yeah, I know what that one's called. Yeah, <laughs> that one's easy. <laughs> it was a hep heptagon. That's what hep heptagon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I was close. Um. All right. So, what do you guys think? Let's walk through each of these one at a time what would you call like what sort of what makes a list a gun line let's start with that one because that's probably the most basic thing a lot of guns it wants to sit there and shoot yeah i mean anything that you know range three at least like i wouldn't necessarily call like uh the black sun like spam i wouldn't call that a gun line per se i mean they have guns but like when i think of a gun line i think a lot more range like you know at least range three plus um yeah higher activations in the like 11 10 at the lowest 11 12 at the highest that's kind of what comes to mind for me yeah i mean like the like an aggressive like a range two gun line quote unquote often yeah. ends up playing more like a melee list than a yeah. true gun line in a lot of ways. I mean, I like a more, like an actual range two gun line is sort of halfway in the middle, but like that, you know, pink sun list wants to be at range one, which for a lot of 
purposes of gameplay is basically melee in some ways and not others. Do we need to change melee skew to like aggro skew? Ooh, like this. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we should have planned better. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we're uh, in like fine wine. You know, we're getting better with every second. <laughs> that's right. That's you know constantly improving. You can only go up, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, examples of this. The classic example is like a clone gun line, which now would probably be like a Cody basically like Cody and a bunch of clones, which I know is something you've been running recently, Tim, right? Yep. Um, yep. There are also some Empire lists that would uh, qualify as this. Uh, there are actually some Rebel lists with Cassian, I think, that would definitely qualify as just like a straight gun line if you don't have Ahsoka in there, but you have like Cassian, some snipers, some vets, and some FDs. Yeah. Um, that would be just like a straight Rebel gun line. Echo Base can make some lists like this also. Um, droids you know the classic droid example is like sp spiders ion spiders with magna guards and a super tactical droid ion spiders aren't as much of a thing anymore but mm -hmm. uh, you can definitely still make you know you can throw a bosk in there instead um, you can still make some droid gun lines so yeah pretty much every faction can do this because it's such a basic you know just put a bunch of like medium to long range things in a list and yep. pack as many of them in there as you can and you've got yourself gun line so um yep. tim since you're of of the three of us i think you're the one to most recently have played an actual like straight peer gun line in, in the cody list so what so what are some considerations you have when you're like how do you how do you do it how do you play a gun line i mean the 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 name of the game is range control right you want to like know what ranges you're shooting like What's your range threat? What range do you want to be at? And for most gun lines in this game, it's often range three or four. Um, you know, a lot of rebel lists want to be at range four so they're not getting shot back. A lot of clone and empire lists want to close to range three. Um, but you really want to be careful about closing range three because once you're in range three, then those more aggro lists suddenly, you're, they're suddenly in jump range. So you're often doing the thing where you're getting exactly at range three so that you're still four moves away for aggro units to get to you. Um, and then you also do need to do a lot of zone control Sorry, because me, you're not... Let me interrupt you real quick. Oh. Can can you explain, because this is competitive 101, uh, okay. can you explain why the exactly range whatever thing yep. is important? So a movement is essentially, like a speed two move with a small base is essentially range one, but not quite actually range one. So if you're sitting at exactly range one of something, i.e. you're like both bases are just touching the end of the range stick, um, a speed to move between those two points would not get you into base-to-base -base contact. So the exactly range four, exactly range three means that a move shoot or a double move would not close, um, or a single move does not close a single range band. Right, so if you're sitting at exactly range four, your opponent can't move, shoot you at range three. Which for like a rebel gun line is super important because you often want to be plinking at range four to do some chip damage before they're able to close range three. Because most like Empire clone gun lines, if they actually get their full dice pools at range three of rebels, are just going to knock them off the table. So, and then most gun lines also don't have the, you know, playmaking potential to like actually knock something off an objective it just except for just killing them um but to do your most efficient killing you kind of need to you know aim shooting um or at least try to get some light shots if those exist so you want to be set up in lanes and zone control so that your opponent has to move into places while you're able to like aim shoot at them instead of, and they'll be move shooting or double moving trying to do objectives trying to get to you etc How do you create a situation with a gun line where your opponent has to come to you? Um, I mean, you're often being the red player because you often want to just spend as many points as you can. So you're trying to find something in what or your blue player and you're using your objective deck. You're often trying to set up a scenario where you're defending. So that can be, um, you know, sabotage the moisture evaporators where you have 800 points, your opponent has less than 800 points. They're 
for a ton or not a ton of reasons one reason but we've discussed it at length many many times but they're forced to make something happen because if the status quo continues uh, the 800 point player would win so in that situation so, sorry here, here's a question yep as the opponent of a gun line yep if, if said player has if 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 your opponent is running a gun line and they have a lower bit than you um why would you ever use their deck especially if they have sabotage in it which you would know ahead of time uh you would not <laughs> okay so this yeah. is like we're we're talking about a scenario that basically doesn't happen. Yeah. Anymore. Well, I mean, okay. you use but like so let's use a, something that might come up more often than like let's okay. say hostage exchange, which okay. is in more decks, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so the gunline players trying to get their hostage out. If they have a lower bid. If they they presume presumably yep. yeah, um, and then you know if both hostages get away, then suddenly it's a gunfight. And then the the gun line can sit there and shoot while the other list that is a gun line or whatever it is has to come attack this gun line. And in general, if you have two reasonably matched, you know, forces, whether they be guns or aggro, whoever is attacking is generally at the disadvantage, unless they're able to get some sneaky shenanigans to ensue. Because they have to move, shoot, or move, move instead of aim shooting. Exactly. Or dodge shooting or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely harder to set up that situation than it used to be. Much and harder. <laughs> maybe that's a good thing. I'm not going to opine on that. Um, but generally speaking, and th this applies to whatever type of list you're playing, not just gun lines, but um, when you go into a game, you're going to want to know, uh, obviously, who has low lower bid, which means whoever wins ties if the game um, ties, which... You know, people are like, well, when does it to kill points ever tie? That never happens. Uh, and in fact, it happens in every single game. Every mm -hmm. single game starts out tied in victory points and tied on kill points. Um, which which means that whoever has the lower bid, it's on their opponent. Uh, if victory points are likely to tie, um, which is possible in a lot of objectives, then it's on the person with the whoever has the higher bid. Uh, to basically like change the status quo and make something happen um and it's it's really important regardless of what type of list you're playing to like sort out whether you're that player or not and then once you've you know once you've decided that just figure out what you're gonna do about it basically so that's yep. definitely not a position you want to see yourself in where you're the one having to make the plays and your opponent like you're gonna go into it thinking all right, there's X percent chance of failure, and it could be greater than 50%. And if it is, that's not a position you want to be in, but like it's what you got to do to, you know, like try to try to get the game back in your favor. Yep. Yeah. And I actually, Austin, I thought you did a great job in the LSO final uh, because you were in that position. And we already talked last week about how the weird, like awkward, draw yeah. setup created a situation where two players at 800 points and one of them you know was still the attacker and one of them was still the defender um yeah. and i thought in that game that was a hostage game um i mean you went aggressively after the hostage which obviously you had to but yeah yeah and i i i wanted something like hostage i i didn't really feel the greatest about kp where you know he could just point all guns on the middle he has force push i don't long march hostage typically droids have trouble with hostage on long march because they don't have a way to get an order that are hostage squad and ai is like a real concern because um you know they just can't get orders out there but with cad it's it's very easy to you know just put him in a position you put him in range two of your hostage and we're just revealing turn one but you've got to have relay on him so like it really yeah 100 percent. yeah but um yeah it's not a it was not a position I wanted to be in, but I was basically trying to evaluate based on how the flop looked, what is my best chance to make a play. I, I figured long march hostage would, would be the best um, just because I can, I can start CAD close enough to his mark two to maybe like one pip on turn two and then just kill his hostage and everything just retreats. 
Um, and then this hostage is kind of sitting out there in the open. So I figured it was my best shot to try to make a play and, uh, you know, had some some lucky uh, magnas. That one squad of magnas, man, like they are, it was the same squad both games and they are sitting on my shelf right now enjoying they're out of commission they're retired i mean they don't have to do anything more there you go yep just yeah. just take oil baths and you know, yeah <laughs> sit on a nice industrial planet somewhere yeah yeah um yeah so uh specific to gun lines uh, you know one thing that gun lines are good at is picking off units with long-range attacks um like I think you were getting into Tim basically, but just like target priority. Yep. It's super important with gun lines. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah. I mean it's it it's hard to give hard and fast rules because every situation is different. But right. I mean you're you're trying to find, you know, at the sort of overall game state, but also at the moment that you're you know ready to aim, shoot, move, shoot. Um, you need to select, you know, what's the biggest threat in the opponent's army that I can shoot at? What's the most, th what's the thing I'm most likely to kill? Um, what is the thing that's actually threatening, maybe not in terms of damage, but threatening the objective? What's threatening a weird melee that'll stop one of my units from shooting? So all those things sort of are like little criteria that you sort of all have to add together and then choose your target. Um, and one of the things that you really need to we're trying to do with gun lines is like you're trying not to shoot five different units you kind of want to pick one and go for it because most of the time just shooting different random units doesn't get you a whole lot um that being said you know shooting like trooper squads killing models takes dice away from their attacks whereas vehicles or characters like if you don't kill them fully you kind of don't need to shoot them at all um so for vehicles and characters you need, to, you need to kind of commit to am i shooting this or not um that being said like jedi if you're given the opportunity to shoot them you kind of always do not as a hard and fast rule but in general you do um because especially jedi or just melee characters in general taking a few wounds off them does actually matter because it puts them in range of you know just punching them to death once they get to you Yeah, two to three wounds on a melee unit, a melee character like a force user before they get in makes a huge difference. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, frankly, like they're not very durable. Nope. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're no more durable than a stormtrooper unit, really. Um, and they're like three to four times as expensive. So, um, yeah, if you can take a shot on a force user, generally speaking, you should. Obviously, you want to be aware of things like dodge tokens uh, or, you know, with Anakin gem, gem so mastery, obviously, like if if you've got a unit that has like a bunch of super expensive wounds in it. Um, like and doesn't have immune deflect or high velocity, you know, like you, you might want to think about it so that, you know, just give away free wounds, um, but you probably still want to take the shot. Uh, especially if it's just deflect and not gem so because it's you know it's really only a one in six chance right that they're going to kill some models um chances are unless you slap them with a ginormous dice pool and if you can do that you probably still want to take the risk anyway um but like you might lose one model statistically don't get me wrong i've seen some crazy rolls where <laughs> you know somebody rolls like like four hits into a force user and then they roll like four surges on the deflect yep. and just totally wipe a unit basically and uh, i've seen it happen but it is not common so i think i think another thing uh with shooting force users is like if you have a lesser uh i guess expensive squad or just finding a way to strip a dodge token yep. before you shoot them you obviously shoot them with the squad that doesn't matter as much you know like right. if you have a naked stormtrooper squad that can shoot them and then potentially strip a dodge or or even if it's a you know if, if it's a cheaper squad like if you've got a you know a full pipe capo squad that's ready to line up a shot you want to try to strip that dodge before they shoot it 
because you know deflect will bypass all their defensive tech that helps keep their models alive yeah uh one one other i mean i play a lot of clones competitively and one other trick can you do with like something it's like oh they might have a huge deflect well you shoot them with like a naked squad and fire support in a good squad mm -hmm. um and then the wounds are taken on the naked squad or you know a squad you're willing to take wounds on right um yeah. there was once where i shot in um echo who had one wound left in from the backfield and fire support into that because echo at that point for the objective didn't matter where he was he was just trying to do wounds so i mean echo died because he got one surge but i think i did three wounds which is totally a good trade right like there's things like that where you can especially with fire support which mostly use clones but other things where you can out, sort of choose yourself where the wounds are going to be allocated and you can play around with that that's a that's a sneaky little trick tim <laughs> yep good old fire support yeah, yeah. On, on the same thing i also shot anakin once with echo they're doing the same thing because i was like one guaranteed wound sure i'll just take on echo and kill the second guy way back in the backfield <laughs> so now immune deflect works whether it's yeah even if it's if it's not all immune deflect weapons in the pool right yeah gems so in that situation i don't think you would even take any wounds oh is it i thought it was it i thought they had i don't know it's it's changed a couple of times <laughs> it has but i think i think now under the crv um as long as there is a immune deflect weapon in the pool then you cannot take wounds from the shot yeah it, um, it hasn't come up recently so i don't know the exact it's not right now. <laughs> super common obviously <laughs> but uh, a tower deflect gemso or Ceresu. yeah yeah, yeah um high velocity mm -hmm. is different yeah uh, high velocity which don't get me wrong is a good thing because high velocity is a very strong keyword uh but yeah high velocity your entire pool has to be high velocity weapons in order for them to not be able to spend dodges so um but immune deflect is not the same in that regard anymore Tomorrow. yeah it, it was different and then it was the same and now it's different again i guess yeah <laughs> okay i don't know doesn't know what it's to be <laughs> ever changing <laughs> yep uh all right should we move on to force user gun lines S slightly topically adjacent well yep. i think we covered gun lines pretty well yeah so what makes this might be a stupid question uh what makes a force user gun line different from the gun line one or more glow sticks <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean just uh you know it's you're allocating more points to a hero with you know good command cards previously good durability uh there are some force users that are still durable like anakin vader kind of uh he's a little bit dicier but yeah just you know a gun line is basically supported by somebody that can get in melee and control have a lot of board you know control in your opponent's army Yeah, I mean, ultimately, force users are first and foremost still objective units, yeah. right? Like, yep. I mean, it's tempting to think of them as like a a unit that who who wants to just get in there and kill as much as possible with their lightsaber, but um, realistically, uh, most of them are just frankly too fragile to do that. Um, Vader is probably the only exception, both because he's more durable than the other ones, but also because so much of his kit and his command cards just like lean into him wading directly into the enemy army and killing as much as possible. <laughs> um, but I would say that's unusual as far as the force user kits are concerned. Most of them are uh, what we've referred to in the past on this cast as like scalpels, which yep. means that you have to be kind of surgical with them um, and you have to use them in a way that like most influences the objective and not just charge them directly into the enemy lines and hope to kill a bunch of stuff do we do we consider palpatine or caesar in that category because he does literally charge in at, at some point in the game Fly, flies in with burst yeah. of speed yeah um <laughs> palpatine okay. is i love palpatine i was a palpatine player for a significant portion of yeah like the early part of the early to mid part of the game um he is a very unique case because he is actually a very good like support force user you know between pull the strings and things like barrier he's he's actually great at just kind of existing in your lines and making stuff happen 
but then of course because of now you will die he always has that potential to just like fly in there and kill four units <laughs> um it, i will say uh that is a lot harder than it used to be because it is significantly harder to get out of cover shots even at close range um and uh that palpatine lightning really hates heavy cover um so uh, the palpatine nuke is not nearly as potentially game changing as it used to be but yeah i mean i mean both palp and anakin kind of act a little bit similar in that for a decent portion of the game they are supporting your gun line helping it do its thing and then they are able to just explode at the end um help is less good at helping the gun line but explodes better and then anakin is better at helping the gun line but doesn't explode nearly as much um but they kind of their their force users are different in that they you kind of end up sacrificing less of your gun line for a force user just because they make your gun line better Yeah, I mean, you've got sort of quote unquote more traditional force users like Luke, written both versions of Luke. Um, Ahsoka is probably one of the newer ones that operates like this, although her two pip lets her skew more into the support she, role if she wants to. She spends like one turn helping your gun line instead of zero. But yeah, and obviously you can give a barrier. Yeah. yeah. Want. But generally speaking, like the quote unquote traditional like Luke style force user model is one that um, other than random free tokens sometimes from command cards doesn't really do anything directly to support your gun line except for like zoning which is very important you know if, if stuff gets close to your dudes then luke chops them up um but uh you know anakin yoda palpatine they all do things like directly for your other units in ways that other force users don't which you know in the uh, era of like slowly creeping uh, <laughs> rules changes that nerf force users, that might be why those are the ones that are kind of still popular is because they don't need to get in there to get your value out of them. Um, but yeah, I would say generally as far as like how to play a force user gun line is it, a lot of the stuff we said about gun lines is very similar. Uh, you're going to have less firepower because you took a force user, which is going to be, you know, at least 150 points. Um, but use them to zone to keep your guns safe. If they have support abilities like Anakin or Palpatine, use them directly to help help those units do stuff. Um, and then, you know, always have a mind for the objective and how your force user can interact with it. Because that's, frankly, their primary job most of the time. So... They gotta have a real good reason to like, you know, on certain objectives like KP, intercept, payload. They gotta have a real good reason to kind of like come out, you know, and and like make a play when the easiest play to make. I mean, you know, old testament Vader with choke, and you know, like you have two options. Actually, he had three options because you could master of evil like turn six on KP, uh, and you know, and just kill her generic officer and panic there like he had so many options but like uh you know there were situations where certain force users can create four and even five count swings on like kp or interceptor payload you know and it's like you gotta have a real good reason to like kind of bring them out in the danger zone uh to like you know not just hold them back for that basically Yeah, it's really all about like picking your moment. Um, and that could come early, you know, depending on what the objective is. Yeah. Uh, it could be later. It's probably not turn one. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> there there have been games where like I'm playing like Op Luke and we're, you know, on hemmed in and you know, okay. they they leave a, a unit just cohered, kind of funny, like a guy off to the side, and I'm like, Well, I can go with Luke. I can, you know, get into melee, like just force pull them into melee and like I'm safe now and Luke's now on his lines turn one. That's, you know, those situations don't come up very often though, but recognizing like when they do, you know, 
it's you kind of don't want to like tip your hand like hey i see that i can do this now and then they kind of like position they're like oh crap he can dive like take a bunch of standbys and you know try to prevent them from happening but i mean you, you can also bait someone if i uh, you mean like use, using your measuring sticks not only as you know measuring and knowing the board but like there have been times where especially if you're playing a gun line slash force user or whatever then you need someone to like sort of just hold for a little bit give you some time to develop yeah. if you just started measuring some stuff and like blah 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 often people will take some standbys or position to like you know like you sweep your range ruler out in a certain direction they'll often try to like get away from that sweep just because they're like oh he's measuring something so i like to um, randomly just measure from my force user to like random terrain yeah. pieces yeah like hmm that's interesting like yeah. sometimes put like a little silhouette if it's your opponent's turn and you're not like like clearly yeah. on your turn you don't want to be wasting a lot of time yeah. but put, put a little silhouette like behind the line of sight blocker you know be like hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah 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 there's there's a little trick i do uh with like it, it's a it's a cad thing kind of where it's like oh you know i'm measuring range five from this b1 to something and like i'm making sure that the bane token that i know is cad is all, i have like the range five out but i'm looking at two and they don't yeah yeah, you know, like it's you know just just little little things like that like you know you never want to tip your hand to your opponent like hey this is what my plan is you know you always want to try to like conceal as much as you can um and you know not not reveal like where you're intending to go like what you're trying to measure often three quick measurements that are unrelated but you're actually one of the matters is better than just measuring your one thing super precisely yeah. yeah 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 i mean and there's sometimes too where hidden information like doesn't really benefit you and in, in those situations we're get, going on a rabbit trail here but um <laughs> uh, it's i find it's usually best to just communicate like as openly as possible about what you're doing and what your intent is um yeah. but there there are definitely some situations where you want to like not play not show your hand so to speak um but there are also lots of other situations where you just want to be as like i mean i'm sometimes guilty of basically like oversharing like you know <laughs> like yeah hmm, if i go here then i can do this and you know um yeah. but yeah communication important uh as long yeah. as you're not trying to like you know I mean, supply, so. things get bumped too and you know like you know I was having some issues with like the staffs on the magnas and mm. you know, uh actually the the first game of day two and the second game, there was like one of the unit leaders got bumped, but like we had already established, hey, they were beyond range three, so they can't move, shoot. Like, you know, they yeah. it's the axes thing, like, hey, exact range three, they can't move, shoot, you know, range two, like and just communicating stuff like that, you know, does help. Like if things get bumped, if you know models get you know tipped over or something like you've already established hey like this is not possible yep yep 100 percent. all right um so yeah uh in summary force user gun line plays very similar to a gun line except you have less guns more force user and um basically that means that you need to get the mileage out of that force user by zoning and or f focusing on the objectives basically and you probably I mean, you don't necessarily have to but this is a archetype that can benefit from bidding so that you can put kind of those like force user objectives in your deck hostage and recover are probably the two most obvious ones yeah. payload used to be but payload isn't really a um, thing that you can reliably take anymore keep, keep um, positions is often a good force user gun line because gun mm -hmm. lines often like key position and then you if you have sort of your playmaker here at the end who can swing a game yeah. yep uh all right uh speeders zoom 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 <laughs> really been seeing a lot of speeders lately but yeah. they're still, i mean they're they're still good but like speeders uh i don't know i mean bombing run breakthrough you know kp are probably their three best objectives and then you 
I the only time I ever put him or a payload in my deck is if I have him then. Yeah. And if I specifically cannot get that combination, I'm looking to see, all right, are there any like is there a deployment where I do want payload? Because if not, you like that's you just kind of come to the table knowing like if you do put payload in your deck with hemmed in, which I I don't recommend anyone playing payload without hemmed in, in their deck. That's just kind not of not anymore. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but you know, just like forcing situations like that where you've got high activation list with you know very mobile units. Um and, and I feel like I mean, can we also throw in like triple tauntauns in this category as well, where they're not yeah white as mobile, you know, but they they still serve the same function, you know, in that like the mobility is huge and they they often like the shorter edge deployments or the long edge deployments, uh, because they have shorter flanking paths, you know, like battle lines, disarray. Danger close too, because that's you know it gives them a lot of play for bombing around and breakthrough, mm -hmm. and opportunities to flank to the extent that that's still a thing. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it, it some it it happens occasionally, it, especially with repulsors. It yeah. comes up more too because you are able to at least see over some of that low stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you're a lot less you're a lot less likely to be able to make that happen on like long march or major offensive mm, yep. or rollout than you are on battle lines or disarray. So yep. Um yeah, I uh you know, speeders at the end of the day are very much like objective units. Um like you said, Austin, they put bombing run and breakthrough in play for you, which is huge. Especially because most non-speeder lists tend to be I mean, breakthrough is a little different because breakthrough oftentimes comes down to like activation count. But bombing run, um, like if you've got a speeder list and your opponent doesn't. It's tough. <laughs> it it is tough. I have found that um trooper lists are actually particularly depending on the deployment, better at bombing run than they think they are. Uh part like if you get like I mean, really, the speeder deployments, right? If you're on disarray or danger close, and sometimes even battle lines, that's not like a huge distance to run a bomb with a trooper unit. Like, if you've got some reasonably durable trooper units that you can put those bombs on, yeah, yeah you're still not going to be as good at it as a speeder list will be, but you're not going to be as bad at it as you think you are. Um, but the big thing of a bombing run is that you have to drop a bomb on turn four. You so have to you're... drop your first bomb by turn four. You're not going to be able to score three points. Yeah, yeah. If you have a lot of one courage units that are trying to carry a bomb, that's that's a problem. Yeah, right. Yeah, you don't want to give them the courage one units. Yeah. Um. But uh, I I will simply say that even though I think it is often the right choice as a trooper list facing a speeder list to veto bombing run. I think sometimes people are like reflexively scared of it in ways that they don't necessarily need to be. Um, so I mean, I, I remember talking to you about, you know, if I have to play the the Blizzard ATST mm -hmm. list, like you know, do do bombing run, you know, break through, like come into positions X Y Z. Do I let bombing run slide to avoid this or that, you know, and. Um, I had a plan if I had to play, like if it was my best available option, um, you know, and like Magnas aren't terrible at it. They're unhindered. Uh, they're durable. They can't be suppressed, you know? Right. Uh, but, you know, it's not, it's not like plan A, but if you absolutely have to, I would play that over key positions where the KP is a box in the middle where an ATSD <laughs> will stand on. And just stand directly <laughs> on top of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so yep. you know, that's that's kind of what I, what the thought is there. Yep, for sure. Yeah, it definitely won't be a plan A, but like it might be better than plan D, uh, in ways that you know it, it's worth thinking about as a trooper list. Um, uh, but... speeders. Oh, uh, I was just gonna mention speeders are actually like when I was playing Blizzard, I had I actually had a lot of out of cover shots where, you know, especially on a turn where you 
compulsory, you know, you transponders get the aim compulsory and then move and you're touching the piece of terrain that is obscuring them. That's like, that's, I mean, that's the primary way now to do it. That often means that you're like very close to your target, which yeah. is not always a good thing. Um, but yeah, I found that with speeders, you can still sometimes get those out of cover shots simply by just like getting ridiculously close to the, I mean, yeah. touching the cover that they're hiding behind. Um, so uh, it's definitely less about angles and more about distance. Yeah. But yeah, you can still do it that way. Um, all right. Force user speeders. I mean, the kind of force user speeder lists are as to speeder lists as force user gun line lists or to gun line lists. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah. I, yeah. So um, I would say it's it's the primary reason that it's different is because force users are objective units and speeders are objective units and you combine them into one list and suddenly you have a pretty silly objective deck. Yep. Um, this is why Blizzard Force was so good for so long is because you could run four speeder bikes with Darth Vader and then play Bombing Run Breakthrough Hostage and, uh, you know, probably KP as like your fourth objective. Um, but, I, you know, I don't know about you, Austin, but I can't count the number of times I ended up on Breakthrough as, um, with Blizzard Force because my opponent would be like, well, hostage, I'm not, I'm not playing that against Vader. And then, oh, bombing run. I don't want to do that either. I guess we're playing breakthrough, you know? And it's like, all right, well, I got four speeders. <laughs> so. And and Vader basically just, I, I, I had a lot of games where they're like, okay, well, this is the best choice, I guess. And Vader just kind of like found a piece of terrain to hide behind, played goalie and killed four activations and everything else went and scored. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it I mean was, yeah, I I mean my my worlds my last two games were the like penultimate game I was able to get key positions against Blizzard Force, which is probably the best I could do, and squeaked that one barely, and then got the next one. It was like, well, I guess we're playing hostage exchange, and if I roll the turn two roll off and don't win, then like that's that, <laughs> right? Like when your objective is can force someone to be like, well, I have a 50-50 chance of like even having a chance. <laughs> right? Like, I mean, even if I win that roll off, it's still like not a good matchup. But um, that objective deck was amazing. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the grossest objective decks out there is the is like Yoda Chewy. Yoda. Yoda Chewy with Barks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so- <laughs> <laughs> like you recover hostage yeah. run and break through and you're like i don't want to do any of this yeah. yeah it's it's uh it's not something you want to play against i guess maybe you want breakthrough because that's probably nine activations yeah. um but even still like yeah I, the i will say about these lists is um you know, speeders and force users are both objective skew units, but they're also both fragile units. So, like, if you can if you can punch a list like this on the nose hard enough, it's going to be a problem for them. And that's kind of where Blizzard historically falls apart too. It's like if you can if you can take out a bike or two, or an HRU or, or whatever, then suddenly like it can kind of start snowballing. So. Yeah, and dark troopers were very good at that. Yes. Bikes like you either you either do the thing where you compulsory in, shoot, peace out, or you just don't engage at all. <laughs> I mean, like Yep. Yeah, because originally I think when Dark Troopers came out, people were like, Oh, well, this is like dead on arrival into Blizzard, and it's like because mm. <laughs> no. you know, yeah, it's easy to look at Blizzard and be like, Oh, it has impact. 10 or whatever it has uh, at the time and uh it's like, well all right so you attack a dark trooper unit with a bike you're range three unless you can do the peekaboo thing which is actually pretty difficult depending on terrain um you end that attack at range three on average you do you force three saves with an impact two six dice pool 
So like you don't even kill a dark trooper model on average. You kill one and a, you know you do one and a half wounds to them, and then the dark troopers attack back and wipe your entire bike unit. <laughs> so, um, like it, yeah, That's it's easy. It. It's easy to look at the raw impact value of Blizzard and be like, this is good into Dark Troopers. But it's, you know, the reality tells a very different story because your impact units are extremely fragile. So. Um, all right. Anything else to say on force user speeders? I covered it pretty well. It's huge objective lists. You're not, you're not trying to table your opponent. Might have low kill points, but objectives are what matter. Yep. Is there so just off the top of my head? I mean, obviously, operative Vader Blizzard Force is not a thing anymore. Commander Vader Blizzard Force still a thing. Um, Yoda Barks obviously still a thing. Uh, Anakin Barks, I guess, but that seems like slightly worse than Yoda Barks. Yeah, you can um, I mean, at least, I guess, with Anakin, you can push it to the time. You can push it to 10 with Anakin, yeah. Which does make a difference, especially on Breakthrough. But I think you're sacrificing a lot in the... Uh, particularly on, like, Recover. Um, but I, th I think you're sacrificing a lot of, like, utility and flex. Obviously, it is, what, 60 more points than Anakin? 50? But um, even still. Uh, yeah, I can't think of any other, like... I mean that's usually that's kind of a rare combination. Force users and speeders both in a list that is like functional and good. <laughs> Can't think of any other ones besides those three. Can you guys? I th I think an argument can be made for separate is small in staps at like twelve activations, but it it's it kind of just falls apart to its counterparts. I think. I mean, Maul's got play on recover, like you know. You don't. I don't think you want to go against Yoda Chewy in that situation. But no, man, I have not seen Separatist Mall in a long time. I guess I got some secret, top secret sauce I'm working on okay. right, Separatist Mall, but it's. I think. I mean, his old play style didn't really change. Like the peekaboo saber throw, you know, like he 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 kind of just goes back to that, and like he's still a good objective piece. He's got great command cards. Um, I, I think, think it's the mall is, in, is a is in a tough spot though. Yeah, and I think honestly, I think the re part of the reason we haven't seen Separatist Mall in a long time is simply because a lot of the units that he's like historically taken with have gotten worse B twos and staffs in particular. Um, you know, obviously both of those got a cost increase. Staffs got uh, absolutely wrecked by the cover changes. Um, and also, you know, Staps have the ignoble distinction of filling the support slot without having impact, <laughs> which from a Litz construction perspective is just not great right now. Um, so yeah, I don't know that like Maul himself has actually gotten worse. It's just that the things he's good with are not really part of like the competitive separatist roster right now. Um, yep. Just um, sad for Maul, but. I, I love them all. I played the heck out of them all when he first came out. But yeah, not as sad as our, our boy Dooku. He's <laughs> he is not as sad as Dooku. Dooku is substantially more sad. Um it's like he's he's gotta be kind of a support piece now, and then he's just like the worst. So like okay, you get barrier. <laughs> yeah, the 200 points for barrier. Point. All right, I guess. Yeah, I guess like, he's only 100 and what 190 now, 185. Yeah. It, he's he's still expensive. Yeah, I, <laughs> no access to surges other than a fifteen point upgrade, you know, and he gets one. Like, yeah, sad days. It's very sad. Very sad days for Dooku right now. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, the next thing on my list here is armor skew. Ah, uh, the good old days. It's fun. It's a lot like a gun line, depending exactly on what vehicles you have. But a lot of the traditional armor stuff is a lot of the same things as a gun line. You're just using heavy vehicles instead of troopers. Um, the benefits being that you don't lose attrition nearly as quickly until you do, and then you lose a giant piece. 
Um, but there are a few armor stuff that, I mean, like T-47 is more, act more like speeders. Um, and then yeah, you got the, like, are absolutely yeah. Speeders, yeah. yeah. And then you have buses that are a little bit like halfway in between and they're often a part of a like aggro list. Um, but basically all the other pieces, like armor pieces more or less don't want to move. Um, a little bit Tempest Force aside, they get free moves. I would say Tempest Force, right? Because yeah, they right. Get like so you do, free moves. Yeah. You don't really want to, and you like Tempest Force. You really don't want to be doing moves with your actions. You want to be getting free moves and then just aim shooting with your actions. I have a counterpoint. Counterpoint. Um, specific to the Tempest Force, and it is actually that. Um, so I played a practice game over the weekend against Mr. Cook, Luke. Uh. And he was playing Who? Tempest, Mr. Luke Cook, world champ. <laughs> um, and he was playing uh, Tempest Force with Triple ATST. And I, we were discussing this too internally on our Discord. But I actually think clearly that the Tempest Force kit is set up to facilitate you just like pushing those ATSTs directly into your opponent's face. Um, and against lists that don't have good impact answers, absolutely, that's probably what you should be doing. Um, but I was playing an Anakin gun line which is what I've been playing recently. And against Anakin, shoving Anakin in armor's face, he's like, dead, dead, dead. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is great. All right, this is saber throw range. Uh, fire support with an RPS, six wounds. Um, so but, only six. Jeez. <laughs> you know, like on average. Right? <laughs> uh, so Luke very wisely, uh, he was basically like, I think, and this wasn't, he didn't know that I was going to be playing Anakin gun lines. This was just like a general thought. He's like, I think the ATSCs are just fine at range three to four and much safer from like a lot of impact stuff is close range or like medium range. And ATSCs can be 100% long range. So basically what he did, which was very frustrating to me, is he would like go as late as possible with ATSCs because you can generally give all three of them eight orders in Tempest Force. Yep. Move into like exactly range three take a shot and then at the start of the next turn progressively go first with each of those atsts take a shot and then back up yep um and it was really hard to do wounds to them um i ended up winning anyway because we were playing recover and uh i will say <laughs> another thing about tempest force is i 100 they need a bid because yep. um especially if you're running the three atst version because you might have like you know, four to five trooper units in that list, and they're all going to be terrible. <laughs> uh, and you want them basically just behind your ATSCs the whole time. So if you run into something like Recover, where you need to like get out in front of your ATSCs with your trooper units, that's not going to be great. Um, neither of us ended up getting the middle box because I couldn't get it out from under the ATSCs, but he also couldn't get any trooper units to it. Uh, he uh, he actually managed to kill one of my box carriers, but then like a different unit heroically rallied on the last turn and picked it back up. Um, but I will say that having played against like an in-your-face armor skew and that kind of Tempest Force where it's like range three and you're actually spending actions to do like peekaboo style moves with ATSTs, um, at least as an Anakin gun line, it was immensely frustrating. <laughs> I did end up killing one of them eventually, but like it took a lot of work and you know like a four four crit z6 shot and some stuff like that to actually make it happen um and i think if if he had done the like shove in your face grenade launcher version of the atsus they would have just all died the uh i mean i've played two games with um tempest force and i have mine equipped with the like just the range tree weapon mm -hmm. i can't like targeting a range tree weapon uh pilot to give surge um and I'm doing a similar thing. I was, I mean, I'm not world champion, but I mean, the couple games I've played have no one's had Anakin, so I haven't been quite as concerned about that range three bubble. But what I was doing is I was like getting range three, shooting, 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 and then like one of them would take some damage, and then I backed that one up. Because mm -hmm. if you can get like if you're playing triple ATSD and all three ATSDs live through like turn three you're in a pretty good spot because like they do like even for lists that can deal with them it still takes like it a takes turn to, yeah. it takes a turn to deal with each one so if you can have all three still alive like going into turn four like 
you basically have ATSTs, ATSTs through the whole game unless something dumb or stupid happens, right? Um, so being able to like have a like I have two uh, repair bots and then just like oh one's taken three or four wounds okay well back up get it back to full and now we're going into like into turn three with three full fully healthy ATSTs and that feels good. Yeah, there's, there's an interesting trick that uh, Liam, Liam and I were Liam's my like local practice buddy. Mm -hmm. group. We're trying to gauge how hard or easy it is to pull off. And it's it's not like impossible. It's it's difficult on, on most deployments, but like if you're taking a bid, if you're getting the deployments you want, uh the the triple ATSD is actually quite obnoxious on hostage exchange <laughs> because you run out of real estate real quick, first of all. And the hostage can also be displaced. Yeah, you can drop what three suppression on them on the first turn probably yep you you obviously you you place them yourself you cohere them towards your lines and then you do that scout two atst move into three separate models yeah yep. yeah and then you block <laughs> the path you know back to their deployment zone with a bunch of free moves and move actions you know and then it's now they have to go around this impassable wall of atsts and it's it's taken them the you know, and that's even if they get Two actions because you just put all that suppression in them. Because you drop three yeah. suppression yeah. on the first but, turn. Yeah. And and if you probably can get three free attacks on one of the turns because you yeah. have a hostage that's near you that's going to trick the three standbys you put on all the ATSDs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, play that on turn. I mean, I guess you could play it on turn one if you're close enough to stuff, but that's probably like a turn two play. Yeah, um, yeah that sounds horrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, it's quite obnoxious. Yeah, displacement is not an enemy effect, by the way. That's for folks listening. That's why that works like it does. Yeah. Uh, it's just an effect, I guess, even though it's being caused by an enemy unit. I've never really fully understood that ruling, but that's how it currently functions. The, so the, the, the funniest thing to do is if you have minefield, you can like displace someone and force them into a mine and then explode the mine with your own like vehicle or whatever. And then they're starting to take suppression and damage off of like displacement and mine. And from the mine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because condition tokens are not enemy effects either. So, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Minefield gets super weird on hostage. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I saw a game of Minefield where someone had like, act, like, you know, whatever, do hostage, put the thing out. And then, for whatever reason, they had two models, like models in two bombs, and someone took a bus and exploded both bombs, and it the bombs killed the naked hostage squad, like on the start of turn one, because I, th I think it, like I think it was three bomb explosions in total, because it was like one single exploded, Roll, one double exploded. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was just like there's a single, there's a hostage sitting there on the start of turn one. <laughs> That's horrible. Yeah. Oh. Sounds the complete opposite of a hostage game I played at ACO. It's like the complete opposite of a hostage squad was just tanking everything. <laughs> Tripped three mines, didn't take a single wound, rolled all the suppression. <laughs> yeah. It's a motivated heroic hostage squad right there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, before we run out of time, how about we talk about Melee Skew and then Bright Tree Village as our last two? I like it. Sounds good. All right, melee skew. It's right. fun. Yeah. It's it's kind of, you know, table dependent. Uh, melee skews are actually also objective dependent too. Very objective dependent. Yeah. You, uh, you know, you're at a little bit of a disadvantage trying to insert your units uh, against gun lines because, you know, you have to close, like, Tons or speed three, like there are faster melee units, but the traditional, you know, speed two, small base troopers, it's hard to kind of insert them because, uh, you know, the whole, okay, exactly range two. So you can't double move into melee with me unless you have some other, you know, method of moving my unit or moving your unit extra speed. Um, so then it effectively takes three actions, which is done over the course of two turns. <laughs> so before they, 
get to go, they could just, you know, get shot and, you know, lose a lot of their dice and or potentially just die. It melee skews are fun though, but uh <laughs> takes a very high degree of like finesse and like map awareness, I think, to really pilot it to success and have like fun with it in high competitive games. Um and you just kind of have to like I mean the table that I played like I if I had to call the list I was playing a, a something like it's it's a melee I think I would call it a melee skew with you know uh a, a hero playmaker and then just supporting that uh basically and the table and the finals was pretty open there were some decent line of sight blockers like away from all the action but nothing like like the middle was wide open I'm like well gotta gotta make something happen because you know I'm just gonna get shot like you know shooting fish in a barrel I got like one piece of heavy cover that I can maybe you know soak some hits but nothing to like completely block on the site and uh you know it was it was a stressful game <laughs> trying to figure out how to insert things where they need to be and like melee skews or aggro skews in general are also often very like li- like in the list building stage you have to do a lot of thinking about how are you going to get things in and what am i doing to get things in because like you know throwing a single aggro melee unit in there um they they can be used as like linebackers to defend your own lines but you know you if you try to run a single like wookie squad up uh, alone like it's just going to get shot off the board um so in general you, you like you, you kind of need to run a melee skew or not um because if you just sort of half asset you're just going to get nowhere with it and then while you're also applying the sort of aggressive pressure right you're like running your things forward trying to get into their lines you also need some other ways to affect the board with your other units um and that's both like locking down objectives and also like just some like plink shooting to like knock some standbys off do a couple wounds um because often you know you're running three raven guards in those are things getting shot your b1s kind of have open license to just like take their op- as optimal shots as they can and you kind of need to do that to help make up the difference between all the attrition you're taking with your expensive units yeah i mean the bottom line is like it we use the term w key a lot uh sort of tongue-in-cheek it's never quite that simple at least not with a melee skew list um you don't want to just like charge directly at your opponent as quickly as possible because that will often just get your melee units killed um you need a plan for closing that distance and as you said austin it's going to be super table dependent you got to see where the line of sight blockers are you have to like really look at the battle cards and the deployments to kind of look at the lanes you're going to have to take based on how those shake out um and hopefully avoid any sort of like long open lanes that you're going to have to cross um yeah i mean you you just you have to be very intentional and careful about how you plan to actually like get in there yep but but also about the w key like sometimes it is about w key like if you have three whatever units if you run one in at a time they're just going to get picked apart and killed right Mm -hmm. like you need a plan to like pick your moment and go when you when you commit you have to commit yeah yeah and like you, you also kind of you can't really pull back. Like once you're committed, you are like you're in for the duration. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yep. Something uh, I'd like to point out in in I'll use my LSO list for example. I have four focus pieces essentially: three, you know, full magna guards, and then Cad Bane. Uh, when you're deciding okay is that is this that moment you can have some reassurance as long as you're playing things correctly that okay i don't need to go i'm gonna play one pit because i want to go first but if i don't get it i have four things able to do what they need to do and if i lose priority i still get to do it with two out of the four things whereas opposed it's like i only have three things in position and i lose priority 
now I only get to do it with one instead of, and then two things get like setting up situations like that where you're like, okay, this is the moment. This is what I'm committing to. And, you know, you have four like nice round numbers are, are always good because you, unless you're playing things with cunning, you can't bank on getting to go first. So like, you know, okay, everything's in position now. Even if I lose priority, okay, these Magna Guards lose two models, three at the worst, like, but then these Magna Guards are full and then they go charge a, a unit that hasn't activated yet. Um, and you just, you trade tit for tat there. And it's like, yeah, CAD takes some heat and some Magnas or any combination of that. And then, but you've inserted two of your four pieces, which is 50%, as opposed to if you only had three, you would only be doing 33%, essentially. So like, just situations like that, you really have to like, you have to have a, a, a plan, like a real good plan. Yeah, and what you're basically talking about is saturation, right? Yeah, yeah. Like when when you when you pick your moment, it needs to be a situation where your opponent's like, you know, I have too many things to worry about right now. Like I, I have five things to shoot, and I I can't do that. Yeah. Um. So, you know, threat saturation, basically. Um. All right. Uh, Tim, how is a bright tree village list different than a melee skew? I mean, you're asking me, and I'm the least experienced with Bytree here. <laughs> well, you're the one that lobbied for classifying it separately yeah. before the cast started. So I want to, I, mean, I, I, I so let me, yeah. I, I think that I agree with you, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on yeah. why. I mean, one of the big reasons is that, I mean, Bytree can be built a bunch of different ways. So for like starters, if you're doing a like full Ewok thing, like there's just so many melee threats, right? Most melee skews have three or four sort of like close range threats which is a lot different than that'd be seven Seven. eight yeah i mean it's like six skirmishers and wicket and then maybe a slinger too right um which is like that's double which is a lot more um so there's like that that sort of big difference where it's just more of a swarm um the other big difference is that like most melee things like melee skews all have charge or relentless or you know ewoks don't they have ability like ways to get a couple right like you can get charge relentless on the command card i forget which one it is it's the three bit yeah but yeah i can't remember if it's relentless or charge but it's it's relentless it's relentless okay so yeah like and then you have call the arms which gives you charge but often i think once you're stuck in it they'll be a lot easier to deal with in some ways and that like if you get out of their range one bubble they can't like move hit you right and they're also all courage one um so like they're gonna be a lot easier to for like even if you are within that range one bubble like there's gonna be a lot of situations where they can't move hit you so they might be they might end up being a lot more tie up and less actual damage than a lot of melee um skews right like they might all get in and like tie every single one of your units up and then it just turns into a mosh pit of who can punch each other to death quicker which ewoks will probably punch you faster um which is a little bit different than dealing with like three magnet guard or three wookies where like you kind of can sort of segregate them off from your army right you sort of try to deal with them on the way in you probably deal with one squad on the way in and then there's two squads to deal with which they're probably they're gonna like mulch squads as they go but like that's still only two two you know activations to turn that are really hurting you there's ewoks are like could be five six seven activations that are in and just like tying you down yeah that's i think that's a fair characterization of like kind of what happens once you get there uh in that you know each individual ewok unit is not as threatening as like a you know like an elite melee unit like a magna guard would be um but they're for their costs they're more than threatening enough and they're definitely gonna outstab like a random stormtrooper or rebel veteran or whatever in melee once they get there um i will say there are a lot of nuances about keeping the Ewoks alive and moving 
I think that are unique to Bright Tree in that, like, like you said, they have Courage One, and they don't remove suppression at the end of the turn. So you know you need some combination of compel via C three PO. Um, which, by the way, we should talk about because I guess we're on the Bright Tree Village topic. They did come out with the uh, CRB oh, yeah. entry for uh, Divine Influence. Um, and on the reminder text for Divine Influence, it, it says that an Ewok unit has to be within range one to be able to Guardian 3PO. Within, of course, meaning, meaning entirely within, uh, which means every single model in the unit has to be like closer than range one to 3PO which is pretty difficult when you're talking about seven model units, seven to eight model <laughs> units. Yeah. Um, the assumption was that it would be changed to at like pretty much every other ability in the game. Um, actually, every other ability in the game. The only thing I can think of that works this way is lead from the front, which seems like, I mean, that's it's a kind of a meme at this point, but seems like obviously a mistake. Um, Vader's might slip in, right? What's that? Vader's might. You, you play well, you, in one Yeah. Time. But Vader's... it's still you pick something at range, right? You target something oh, okay. at range. Well, sorry, yeah, you're talking. It's about just it. the yeah. the relocation bit that is within. Yeah. Um. There's there's nothing that actually targets something within range one, uh, except for lead from the front and now divine influence. And they they came out with the CRB entry, and it also says within. Um. The, <laughs> that makes three PO pretty difficult to use. Obviously, you can probably still fit like two units in there. In that little range one radius, maybe three if they're like super efficient with your positioning. But then those Ewok units probably aren't doing anything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so your best bet is to just like hide them behind a line of sight blocker and not rely on divine influence. Uh, even even when divine influence, uh, even when people assumed it would be corrected to be at, um, you know, C three PO kind of could be viewed like a like a cash machine where you can just kind of cash in. Ewok wounds in ways that bypass low profile on dodges. Yep. Um, just by shooting 3PO. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's you, like you don't want 3PO to be shot, regardless of what the at within thing ends up eventually being. Um, you, you want him to hide him behind a line side blocker. But also, like, he, he has compel, so your Ewoks need him to keep moving. Otherwise, they're going to get the crap suppressed out of them. Yeah. I, you, I think you really need to leverage infiltrate with him. Like you need to stick him where he needs to be at the start, hopefully like something very well hidden. Yeah. Um. Right. Like I mean, often there's buildings that have like almost like a concave. Uh, yeah, I think it's concave. Like the one that goes in. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like a, a slightly in wall so that like he's hidden from more than just one side. Right. Like you want to, and then also like you can utilize like compel his range one to two. So like you also want to be thinking like Ewoks are you know many wound or many uh, models like you want to make sure that you have at least one guy, um, and not a guy you are gonna kill, um, at range two of him right and and that like this could be a situation where you put C three PO so far forward that suddenly like you have to forward compel some Ewoks and this could be a situation where forward co- forward cohere is actually like the thing to do, so. Yeah. It's like I don't see like playing C3PO, it's like I don't want him to ever move. Right. Like he yeah. he wants to like do his like gives a couple surges and like take a dodge. Yep. I don't get shot. Yep. Yep. And you can you could also utilize a uh ATST. <laughs> right. Um so, like for him to hide behind. Yeah, like if you yeah. don't have uh good enough line of sight blocker like you could make one right like put him behind a wall drive the ATSC up to that wall so that suddenly you have a like 90 degree hidden corner yep. and now C3PO is safe as long as that ATSC is there right that's that's gotta be like the biggest thing that I think for me at least separates Bright Tree from like a traditional mini race queue you're like you can't really bring I mean I guess I guess droids have cheap enough core where you could maybe get 10 activations uh and then three magna guards with an aat but I'm trying to think like what the points would look like i think everything would be pretty bare bones um it wouldn't it wouldn't be like great but i think that's the biggest thing that stands out is like having chewy in a 
uh, basically an unshootable until you're ready, until you you get to decide to break it. Like yeah. you get this with this wall that you can, uh, I think you can hide three full units of seven Ewoks if you like rank and file like perfectly. You know, all right, one, two, three, four, five. Like I think you can hide three full units behind an ATST. Uh, well, and a yeah. full facing angle. A firm e forward e facing e angle. Yeah. yeah. E I e think e in e practice, e it's probably two. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I generally don't like to hide behind cylinders because they're easy to flank. But like with hit with Chewie, you can easily make like, I mean, you, you often see those like trees that exist on like endor tables. Uh, we'll put an ATSC beside that. And suddenly that tree goes from no LOS to quite a big wall. Right. Like you probably want to utilize Chewie by like running up to a smaller LOS so that you have a yeah. decent frontage, a different angle. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, Chewie also brings Inspire 3, which, which you're going to need if you're constantly compelling your <laughs> EMR troopers. Um, Logre also has Inspire. Um, and Courage 3, which is big. And Courage 3, yeah. Which is huge to prevent your Ewoks from panicking after you're constantly compelling them. So His heal um, is pretty good too, I think, for you know just keeping your body count up. Yeah, it's um i think it's that's a like if you have the points kind of a thing um simply because it's an action and um you could also use that action to just like dodge and pass any walk a dodge um but uh is it's is wait is it an action i'm sorry for, it's, it's it's a free it's, action but it's recover right correct you have to yeah. you have to spend an action to recover every turn yeah. if you want to keep using it is the, the yeah the the like i believe it was mentioned on a podcast might have been I was I don't know, but the like move with offensive push <laughs> get so then you have two tokens to give out, I think, with the with the aid special card. Oh, uh, with the, his in, independent. It's yeah, actually yeah. three because he's got okay. So be so you could give like three tokens a turn plus a heal. Move recover. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> actually. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I also think that he will often want to be moving anyway, right? Like, because Augre doesn't have infiltrate, like, he needs to be moving up with your lines, yeah. So, and range one is pretty short for aid purposes, so yep. Um, yeah, I tend to agree with that. I will say that I think that Ewoks are much less likely to benefit from aims than from dodges. Uh, which, oh, 100%. Yeah, um, if, there, if there was a like, if there was a um. Offensive push Ag Agile, yeah, yeah, that would be, yeah, yeah, that um, needs to be an upgrade. That totally, yeah, yeah. New we, short, put that on a short list of neutral upgrades if we ever get those again, <laughs> uh, which is not a, a guaranteed thing. Yeah. Um, it would be the, nice. um, the other that. thing about your Ewok heroes too is that like they're just meaty enough that like to kill them, you kind of need to like put an actual full squad into them, mm -hmm. right? Like. I mean, you don't want to be losing Law Gray, Wicked, or C3PO, but like often, like a shot against them means, well, you didn't lose Ewok bodies in that shot, right? Like sometimes them getting shot is maybe not a win, but a neutral, right? Um, and there are moments later in the game where you can run them out in the open to go do stuff because, well, if they, they get shot, like that saves wounds elsewhere and they can go do the things, right? Like don't get him killed willy nilly, but they don't. Don't let the sort of idea of like they have to be hidden the whole game, like make you make bad decisions. Make them work. For yeah, yeah. I I will say I think that's more true of Wicket than the other two. Oh, um, I mean Wicket needs to be doing things. Yes, but yeah, but like if three PO or Logray go down, that really like cuts the knees out from under your entire army's mobility. Yeah, this, really, this I is think. a mostly like turn five six thing yeah, where yeah, it's yeah. like right like this is not a if you get law gray slash c3po killed on this necessarily on like turn two three like yeah that's uh no bueno yep <laughs> um what about objectives for break tree break through basically counting objectives yeah <laughs> yeah breakthrough kp intercept I think if you have wicket, recover is defensible. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah, 
I, I, yeah, I've been doing, and at least in my theory crafting, it's cover breakthrough, KP hostage. Yeah, because how a scouting party works on hostage. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think those are probably the four best objectives for breakthrough. Yeah, there's your ATST displacement counter, Austin, the scouting party, the hostage. <laughs> the um, the other one too is like, I mean, payload is also pretty good for them. Yeah. Um, and it just sort of like, I mean, I think payload and recover, depending on your play style, might be the like shift out there. But if you bring payload, you kind of have to bring him in and like, yeah. Yeah, I I think you're bringing hemmed in. I mean, in you're general, definitely bringing hemmed in anyway. Yeah, with I I mean, very much in general, any list I build that doesn't have sab, um, like sabotage and your vaporators, I bring hemmed in. Yep, I like, agree. So, all right. Any final thoughts, gentlemen? There's a lot of honey this year. Well, Tim is a beekeeper for those that <laughs> don't know. Haven't listened to any time I've been on. So the, we, the honey is, uh, is pretty pretty high, huh? Pardon? The honey supply is pretty pretty high, huh? We just poured our 75th ish barrel of honey today. That's a lot. Wow. <laughs> And we haven't fully emptied the box yet. Anything how many, that's how many bees do you have? Fifteen hundred hives. Hives. Yeah. How many bees per hive? Right now, probably fifty thousand ish. Fifty thousand bees in each hive. Yeah. Wow, I did not know it was that. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> we 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 are commercial beekeepers. <laughs> What's if you see like a random beehive in the wild? How many bees does that have in it? It depends on the type, like time of year. But like, I mean, like when you when you drive around and you see the stacks of bees, like each box can be like a few thousand easily. Like most hives, like when they're, I mean, they just like because it's right now it's peak production, right? They're ramping up, mm -hmm. but sort of their stasis would be a few thousand to 10,000 ish. And then they ramp up to like 30 to 50,000 in bee production. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of bees. Yeah. Wow. It's a lot of bees. <laughs> I'm still trying to wrap my head around that. I mean, the fact <laughs> that you, you're, you're looking at what's the number? 5 million bees in total. Give or take, yeah. I haven't counted, but <laughs> I haven't counted. Yeah. After, after one, two, three. <laughs> Damn it. One, two, three. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. A, a, the, the queen bee, like, I mean, there's one queen per hive, a queen bee in like peak production can lay up to 2,000 eggs in a day. A day. Wow. Yeah. Man, that's, that's a lot of. It's like egg laying. Yep. Here You're we are, taking happy. nine months to produce one, yeah. one spawn. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, queen bees are like two thousand a day, no problem. Yep. That's nothing. <laughs> you do one every nine months. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are way off topic. Um, you guys have any final legion thoughts? I still don't think, like, aside from like. Gunline's still good. Any clones good. Boba Fett good. Still don't think like we have a really defined meta. I think there are a lot of options out there that like and a lot of room for experimentation still, I think. Is that a brand new ATSD, Tim? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, uh, we know it went there. Who was gonna be playing? That's yep. that, that's my thought. You better have a plan for that. Let's put it that way. Um, if if there is a, I think you're right, Austin. I think that there is definitely some good diversity in terms of like across the factions. 
yeah. um, within each faction, it feels like there's some internal diversity issues. Um, and I think part of that is because you need a plan for armor skew. <laughs> Yep, and and certain factions have pretty limited options for dedicated impact weapons, particularly rebels, um, but also droids. Really, yeah, that's you know, you can only you can only do what you can do with what you have, and like magna guards having to like, it it does it does seem kind of like if all they're doing is aim shooting at range four the whole game, you're. Like, why can't that just be a B1 rocket? <laughs> you know? Right. It's 110 points for yeah. Yeah, an impact two rocket, basically. Like, yeah, I guess just take it on a B1. And sometimes when you shoot, you're gonna be shooting armor and heavy cover. Right. So, you know, red, black, white might be one through cover if you're lucky. Which never mind. I don't want to get on a cover rant. Let's just say that when I was <laughs> playing with Luke, there were multiple times when uh we were like, is that cover? And both of us were like, I <laughs> have literally no idea. Like, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> um, yeah. I, would you say that was an unfun experience? It was, uh, <laughs> I would say it was a confusing experience and therefore a frustrating one. Um, I find it like, the, I'm not getting on the cover. I find <laughs> the normal cover rules frustrating and boring. But at least, like, you can sort of, like, follow the process. Not as easily as you could before, but you can still, like, actually go through the steps and reach a conclusion when it's trooper to trooper. When a vehicle's involved on either end of it, it's like, Meh. Yeah. <laughs> Let's roll a dice. I don't know. Um, which we did several times. Uh, you think if two people, people could figure it out, it's me and Luke Cook, but I guess not. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If AMG's listening. Uh, um yeah. I uh anyway. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about Nova Open, which will be in a month, roughly. Um yeah. I gotta figure out what I'm playing for that. So maybe it'll just be Anakin clones because I wouldn't have to paint much. I don't know. We'll see. I really wanted to play Cal's for Lone Star, and I'm slightly regretting not doing it. Yeah. But that triple dark trooper matchup round one. Oh, I would have lost 100%. <laughs> if I was playing my Empire list when I got hit that matchup, I 100% would have lost. And instead, um, Anakin made it very different. <laughs> so, oh. Say yeah. throwing fire supported into dark troopers oh. is maybe oh. the most cathartic thing in Legion. It's so satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's incredibly probably. satisfying. Yeah. I saw that was a thing. I was like, well, uh, I don't really want any part of that. <laughs> yeah. It was I mean, not, even it just, was not even, a, a. Sorry. sorry even, ahead, even just throwing his lightsaber without a fire sport is still fun. Yeah. It's guaranteed like, one and a half dark troopers off. off I like, I last first did it like Anakin basically running by a unit of dark troopers. And it's like, well, there's three models off the table. Yep. Right. Yeah, by the end of that game, the dark troopers were like running away from Anakin. Um, <laughs> it was a, it was it was one of those like uh, he it we ended up on rapid reinforcements and um, I created a situation where basically if we toilet bowled, I would just win. So he had to like rapid reinforce his dark troopers basically right next to my army, which is what dark troopers want to be doing anyway. But I was saber throwing from turn one. Um, <laughs> And I got, I did get an RPS fire support in there. He smartly like targeted an RPS and I think he killed it like midway through turn two. But by that point, I had already done two f RPS fire yeah. supports with Saber Throw and he had like two half Dark Trooper units and I had Anakin basically still at full health. So then I just started chasing them with Anakin and Saber Throwing them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's just Saber Throw with Anakin is just so good into Dark Troopers. But yeah, if I had the chaos list, I would have been like, I guess I'm gonna start crit fishing and these red saves with mortars and yeah. you know short troopers. <laughs> yeah, Boba Fett, you know. I mean Boba Fett helps, especially with simple man, but it's it's hardly like yeah, any sort of it's not it's not Anakin Saber Throw, let's put it that way, in armor. 
it in today's meta it feels bad that Boba's rocket isn't like impact three or four. Mm-hmm. It's only impact two, right? It yeah. is only impact two. I yeah, mean, you probably that... still have a good shot at forcing like four saves because he's search crit. Yeah, but it it's right. Like I mean, just even just not being you know, in back three with three red is just like it just hurts in today's meta. It's yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's like probably the only consistent thing in the meta is like you whatever you are playing, like you do still need to have an answer for armor. Like that's that's yep. like there's a lot of different list diversity, but you armor is is at the top, like you have to prepare for it or you're just gonna roll. Yep. Yeah, if you're rebel, just bring Cassian and FDs, I guess. Oh solid. Yeah, I mean they're good anyway. Uh but yeah, I don't. I think you have to bring in at least one FD mm. um, with the barrage generator, not not the not the suppressor. Uh, the, I think the barrage generator is the suppressive one, right? Isn't it the uh, overcharge, the overcharge? Overcharge generator is the yeah impact one. Yeah. I think yeah. That's bring the one that has impact, whichever one that is. <laughs> yeah, it is overcharged. Is one you want. Yep, there you go. <laughs> Bring that one. All right. Well, I think we should uh, close this out. What do you gentlemen think? I think we covered a lot of ground. We did. Closing yeah. time. Closing time. I, I, was hoping, I, was hoping, I knew I wasn't going to get Kyle to do it, but I figured I'd get Timbo. <laughs> I did it in my head. It's hard not to. <laughs> um, yeah. There's there's some songs where like it's just instantly just pops in there and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> I saw I saw a great uh it was like an explanation of how the echolocation works. Yeah. And it's a bat and a mosquito. And the bat goes, um, sweet Caroline. And then the mosquito goes, bum, bum, bum. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. Uh anyway. Um, thanks for coming on, Austin. It's great. So congratulations on your string of victories thank you thank you N- now that you have a flight you can kind of like you know yeah. let's let some other people have a turn <laughs> oh that yeah no that's i'm uh hopefully judging it packs so okay. you know, still try to like be active see people but yeah i'm just kind of like there's nothing really left to go after you know and uh just like do fun you've, stuff. you've peaked no, 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 no. It's, <laughs> I mean, you know, we still got, still got worlds. I, I fell short of doing what I wanted to last year, and uh, I regret bringing the list I brought. But Dark Troopers made me do it. So, of course, you made me do. Yeah. yeah. What I learned is don't let the boogeyman influence what you play and what you do, because sometimes the boogeyman's not not as scary as you think it is adjust to it don't flip yeah. the table um, yeah yeah yep yep all right well we are the notorious scoundrels i'm kyle i'm austin i'm timbo stay fresh cheese bags